Hello everyone, I am so excited to make this video because it would be such an interesting idea like reading these classic books to see A, if they hold up and B, are they still relevant? And I mean, hey, after this past week, one of the students in my college started posting uh, posters everywhere saying that <laughs> the school banning us from smoking in bathrooms is like 1984. I decided that I have to actually see if he's correct. Without any further ado, here are the books that I'll be reading this month. I'll see you when I finish the first one. Oh my god, what a banger of a book this one was. We start off in this factory where like children are made on a conveyor belt and the writing style very much mimics that scene because it's very uh, metallic, rhythmic. It really situates you in that uh, scene. The characters were all very thought provoking for me as well. They were all kind of on the scale of on one side really idealizing pleasure and on the other side idealizing pain. The author did a very good job of showing how detrimental these two extremes are because if you idealize pleasure then really nothing is uh, significant but on the other side when you idealize pain you're truly not making a difference in anyone's life you're just bringing attention to yourself and it's almost narcissistic in a way but is this still applicable to the real world and 100% yes. I was shocked how Huxley was able to predict so many of the things that would happen. But there are two things that really stood out to me. The first one was the emphasis on agelessness and it, and it really reminded me of Hollywood nowadays. For example, Hugh Grant is being slandered, uh, at least he was on the Willy Wonka tour, for looking his age and that he's not as hot as he was when he was like in his 20s. On the other hand, people really want to have that sexy baby look. Forgive me for quoting Taylor Swift. Well, you know, Kim Kardashian, Jennifer Lopez, people like really praise them for being able to stay so youthful. And I mean, we have like 12 year olds buying all these skincare products to prevent aging. Girl, you're 12, you, you haven't... <laughs> You haven't aged yet. There's also this monologue at the very end of the book where John the Savage presents to us this trifecta of what he thinks is important in society. And he says that it's science, art, and God. Although like, I'm not really religious, so the God part didn't really resonate with me as much. I thought that the science and art argument were so thought provoking and very moving. And I agree 100% because it's so much easier to just lay in bed and scroll through Instagram or TikTok or whatever, um, instead of being actually actively present in the culture. Anyways, that's all I think about Brave New World. I really, really hope you read it, it's fantastic. And now I'll be moving on to A Clockwork Orange. All right, sorry to break the bubble of positivity, but uh, I hate this book. If you don't know, this book is written in this dialect called Natsat. It should have been easier for me to read because I'm Polish and a lot of the words um, were very similar to Polish words or like Slavic words. Uh, for example, Czelovek was used to describe human and człowiek in Polish means human. That being said, it, this was still so stupidly difficult. Like I, I actually don't know how people get through this book and actually have any ounce of enjoyment for it. Ooh, yeah. Though it could be argued that since there's um, like a lot to be said in this book about like self-pleasure and it kind of makes an argument of uh, why good and evil are both um, inherent in humanity and why perhaps we shouldn't just suppress evil like 100%, maybe the limits uh, of that, which are acceptable, that perhaps that was kind of the aim of the author to kind of have us have this like difficult experience with reading the book and still getting something out of it. I don't care. I read books that have done that. House of Leaves did this, but it did it so much better. That being said, do I think it says something and does it deserve to be a classic in my eyes? Yes. Yes, but I think you're better off watching the movie version. Okay, someone lied to me about this book and I need to hold you guys accountable because all I heard about for Fahrenheit 451 was that it was a snobbish book that just said, movies bad, books good. No, this is such a banger of a book. Not as good as Brave New World, but, but I digress. Um, I think Ray Bradbury is 
a genius at creating these masterful smaller moments and sequences and also very evocative imagery. For example, there's this character Beatty who gives a speech like halfway through the book, I think, which I think is a masterclass. And it's so scary because I feel like a lot of the changes he describes are being implemented. Man, those scenes are just god tier, god tier. Unfortunately, I feel like Ray Bradbury's downfall is these great scenes are linked by passages that just are really mid. Are not. That's why I think that I prefer his short stories because you get rid of the fluff that connects the fantastic scenes and instead you just focus on those fantastic moments, if that makes sense. Um, I've now read two works by him, like longer works by him, and I had the same problem with Something Wicked This Way Comes. So going back to the snobbery that I thought uh, was a little bit present, I don't think that TV and movies are bad. Like. I think what Ray Bradbury was trying to get across more was that um, it's important to consume art and think critically about it. And I think that he kind of made it seem like you can't think critically about things in the visual medium, but I, I disagree. Um, so yeah, that was like one bit of the snobbery that I felt was there. But other than that, yeah, this was really good, very thought provoking. And I highly, highly, highly recommend you check it out and stop listening to the naysayers because they're lying to you. Moving on, now I'll be reading The Handmaid's Tale. So I finished The Handmaid's Tale and it wasn't really at all what I was expecting. When it comes to the enjoyment level, I don't really think I enjoyed a lot of it. Before I say anything, I just want to preface it all by saying I find this style of stream of consciousness writing to be quite laborious to read. I find that there's usually a lot of fluff that doesn't need to be there, uh, which is why Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf, they don't really work for me. And I feel like here at, at the very end, when we find out the context for The Handmaid's Tale, I think the stylistic choice 100% makes sense, doesn't align with my personal reading tastes. But I don't think reading is, you know, supposed to just be fun. Like I, like I said in my previous uh, Fahrenheit 451 segment, like I do think that actively engaging with uh, the art that we consume is very important. And so I'm glad that I read this book. It also could have just been hard to read because like as a girl, like I, I really felt all the fear and the, the lack of autonomy that was experienced by our main character, Offred. Does this deserve to be a classic and is it still relevant? And as a person from Poland where, you know, reproductive rights have been quite intensely limited recently, I think, yeah, this is very relevant. And again, that's why I'm saying I'm very glad that I read it. It's also quite scary because as I did research, Margaret Atwood said that she actually based a lot of the ideas that this new government is bringing in on things that actually happened in some countries in our real world, which is terrifying to think about. But yeah, I think that if you like Sylvie Plath, Virginia Woolf, that writing style, then all my qualms with it will be basically gone and you will find this dystopian to be very interesting, especially because it's very different um, to the ones by, that I've read by male authors so far. I think this had the best world building in the start because the idea is that everything is like super mega mathematical, you know, and he describes things that are like irrational and crazy as the square root of negative one, which is irrational. It's a, an irrational number. I really liked how our main character's uh, diary, because these are diary entries essentially, I liked how they were very methodical, mathematical, theoretical at the start. And then as his worldview starts changing, um, how they become more unhinged and more in that style of like Sylvia Plath, Virginia Woolf, Margaret Atwood, where it's more like stream of consciousness. So I found that to be very, very intriguing. Maybe it's that change in writing style, which again, I liked the artistic choice, made it the later parts much more difficult for me to read. But I feel like at some point, uh, the main character meets this woman called I-33 and it becomes weirdly sexual and less so much about the dystopian society and more so about like forbidden love and how like she's making him feel all these things and 
ah, you know and then at the very end the way that the book ended I think also just kind of I don't know perhaps I undermined some of the themes before so I don't know I, I was very conflicted towards the end but I loved 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 the start it also ties in a lot thematically to Brave New World but I think just Brave New World um did it better which I don't know maybe Brave New World was inspired by it as well. I don't know, I'll write on the screen whether it was or not. Mainly, I read this as a primer for 1984. And so when I finish reading that, I'll really want to compare the two and see what Orwell took from Zamyatin and if he did it better or worse. I'll check back in then. <laughs> All right, I'm finally done with 1984, and this is definitely my favorite just classic dystopian that I've read for this video. Wow, I'm so glad that I read We before this, because I feel like Orwell took pretty much copy-paste most things from We and just made them so much better. Everything from the focus on the relationship that our main character Winston develops with his love interest, which here is Julia, and she kind of does play the role of I-33, I but she really has so much more depth and agency to herself. The books and also in a very similar uh, fashion, but there's no even argument that I think you can make that Zamyatin did it better because Orwell, man, I really don't want to spoil this book for you, but Orwell took that ending that of We and changed it to be so much more visceral. That being said, I do feel like the world building of We was still kind of more interesting to me because I loved how mathematical everything was in the start, whereas here we do have uh, like this book called The Red Book and it does kind of take us on this tangent where we have like three chapters I think from it pulled and it's just uh, you know world building uh, and info dumps but I found those info dumps very very interesting so I'm not complaining. Winston is a better main character. We learned so much more about uh, the bureaucracy of uh, the party and Big Brother than we do about the benefactor and his party and we. I do think that out of all of these dystopians that I read, Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451 are perhaps more relevant than 1984, uh, which I think that might be a hot take. In general, I, I think I just really like Orwell's writing style because there was no fat to this book. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. There are obviously other classic dystopians that I really want to read, like Parable of the Sower but by um, Octavia Butler, uh, because I loved her book Kindred. But I think I might do like an author deep dive for her, so I'm saving that for that video. I don't know, we'll see. But yeah, if you have any classic dystopians that I didn't talk about here that you'd like to recommend me, let me know. I'd love to see a ranking of the ones that you have read from this list. But yeah, anyways. Uh, that's all from me. Before I say bye, I just want to say thank you so much for the kind messages that I've been receiving uh, for my exams. I really hope they went well and just having all that support from you was oh, it was so sweet. Also shout out to Steve Canada. Uh, your messages are always so so nice and uh, all my friends uh, are like your biggest fans <laughs> as well. So anyways, that's all for me and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!